Have you ever wondered what it truly means to be sent by God? To be used by him and be a part of spreading his great and glorious gospel that we see in Jesus Christ. Well today, on Mission Sunday, you are going to be hearing from Dave Werns as he unpacks from God's word what it means to be an ambassador for King Jesus. So whether you're joining us for the very first time or you're a part of our church family, we are glad that you are here. Let's start by worshiping our great God. She's over me. 
is paid my penalty. See him pleading in the garden. See him bleed at Calvary. Hallelujah, I'm forgiven. Christ has paid my penalty. See him pleading in the garden. See him bleed at Calvary. Hallelujah, I'm forgiven. Christ has paid my penalty. I will arise and go to Jesus. There I will find Him. His embrace, endless joy, and ceaseless wonder. When I see. Behold our Savior stands in heaven And can you fathom all he's done Never sinner must you wander when to Jesus you have run. Oh God, thank you for your great mercy. Thank you that we can come to you no matter where we're at. We don't have to clean ourselves up first. But we can come to you and trust in your grace and know that you will provide. Today is Mission Sunday here at Grace Fellowship Church. And I wish somehow I could pack all of you up and take you around the world to see everything that God is doing in and through and with his people. But 
that is both financially impractical uh, and probably logistically impossible at this point, uh, even without a, a global pandemic shutting down borders and grounding planes. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. So instead, I'm going to take a few minutes today to give a, a State of the Union address uh, about what God is doing in the, the world of missions here at, at Grace Fellowship Church. If you folks aren't very familiar with cross-cultural ministry here at Grace, um, our leadership has always felt that it is way better to invest heavily in, in deep, long-term relationships and partnerships rather than try and have a, a broad range of shallower partnerships with maybe just nominal backing. Some of you might remember when Kroger only sold groceries. Can you imagine that? Right? Today, though, you could walk into Kroger and, and meet somebody while you're in line for coffee, and then take them out to a nice uh, deli lunch, maybe transition to a, a classy sushi dinner. If things go well, you could even stop by and pick out an engagement ring. You could go get a mortgage. Folks, you could furnish that, that new house with your new spouse all before getting to the cereal aisle. At Grace Fellowship, we see our missions program a little more like one of those family-run specialty shops. Right? We, we have fully stocked shelves, but we really only carry a couple of products. We have biblical counseling training, and we have least reached people groups. That is our entire missions business. And I'm happy to tell you, business is good. In Romania, Albania, Germany, the Czech Republic, biblical counseling training is surging ahead thanks to God's faithfulness in three key factors. Number one, we have workers that are faithfully sacrificing their lives for the sake of the gospel in each of these places. We have Doug and Diane Marksberry in Romania. We have Blair and Sue Alvidrez in Albania. Ken and Beth Long serving in Germany. John and Sandy Dostal and their family serving in the Czech Republic. Their combined years of service are longer than I've been alive. The second factor uh, that, that helps this biblical counseling training become an anchor, a, a, a beachhead in Europe, is the faithfulness of God in providing passionate local partners who are willing to pick up the baton of biblical counseling training and run with it in their own countries, in their own communities, maybe even their own churches for some of these places. And the last key factor to seeing this kind of fruitful ministry is God's faithfulness to you. Grace Fellowship Church, he has been raising up prayer warriors, people who faithfully pray for the works and efforts in these countries. Your persistent prayers are being felt all over the world. James chapter 5 says the, the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. So thank you for praying. And thank you for giving. Your, your generous Sacrificial giving has enabled us to expand our biblical counseling training partnerships into two very different uh, but very exciting regions. We're looking into Japan and Ethiopia. And maybe the most exciting aspect of these new partnerships is the relative youth of the people that are involved. In both Ethiopia and Japan, spirit-filled millennials are faithfully standing on the sufficiency of Scripture, boldly handing help and hope to a hurting world using their Bibles. It's no surprise that some of them have been trained in biblical counseling right here at Grace Fellowship. Some of them have been raised right here at Grace Fellowship. I've had the pleasure personally of walking with Jordan and Lauren Thomas through several seasons of their life. They were students in our student ministry while I was still serving there. Uh, I actually got to perform their wedding. My wife, Andrea, and I did their premarital counseling. And now, Grace Fellowship is collaborating with their new home church in Louisville, Kentucky, to send them to Ethiopia as part of a uh, church planting team. It should be no surprise to anyone that Lauren graduated this May with a degree, a master's degree, in biblical counseling. Guess where she learned about that first? right here at home. Folks, this is a story of God's faithfulness in and through and to His people. 
And, and I could probably stop there, just say amen, and we would close. But, but God is doing so much more than just that. Working on behalf of the least reached people groups in the world. In Iraq, in Thailand, in, in Japan, in Papua New Guinea, and in Southeast Asia, God is raising up passionate, courageous pastors and disciple makers who are they're making his name famous in places where maybe it hasn't been spoken in, in thousands of years. And perhaps the most exciting of all is how God is faithfully sustaining and providing for that handful of workers that for security purposes, I, I can't name. I can't even tell you where they're living. And in spite of these challenges, the risks, the overt resistance to God's kingdom, his word is advancing. God's word is being proclaimed to men, women, and children who were born into spiritual darkness. They're hearing it for maybe the very first time ever. And these are just the first steps, folks. These are the first steps that Paul laid out for us uh, in Romans chapter 10. If you work backwards from verse 15, he says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Because when those people are sent, they will preach. And when they preach, the lost will hear. And when they hear, the lost will believe. And when they believe, they will call on the name of the Lord God. And according to the prophet Joel, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's not a matter of if. It's just a matter of time. Folks, we are living in unprecedented times. And no, I'm not talking about the coronavirus. And, and I'm not talking about our global unrest. What I'm talking about is the gospel of Jesus Christ Advancing in the world in a scale and a scope that has never been seen before. Friends, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God is rising in our world as surely and as steadily unstoppable as the tide. That may come as a shock to some of you. Right? It may seem to you that our world really is just getting more dark and that darkness is getting deeper every day that the wickedness in our world is getting more evil, that the, the resistance to the truth of the Bible is only getting stronger. If that's you, I would encourage you to remember something. A wild animal is never more dangerous than when it's trapped. It, it might be aggressive when it's free, but it is savage when it's pinned. Folks, our enemy is that pinned animal. He knows his days are numbered. He sees that day approaching same as we can. And no matter how cunning or how ferocious, he is fighting a losing battle. God's kingdom is advancing. God's word is unstoppable. His victory is inevitable. And he's given our people, the, the folks he sent out from Grace Fellowship Church, he has given our people the honor and the privilege of being on the leading edge of that advancement. Folks, we have so much to be thankful for. Our people are on the front row seating of God's power and his mercy and his faithfulness on display to the world. I wish every church had at least one member that was sent by God to the front lines just to bear witness. Folks, we have over 20. Double that if you count the number of collaborators and, and partners that we've engaged with over the years. Friends, if you're struggling to get excited about this, if you, if you see yourself as sort of on the outside looking in, I have a rare and wonderful opportunity for you. One of the families that God is sending out from Grace Fellowship Church is just beginning their journey to the mission field. And you have the chance to get in on the ground floor of what God is doing for the least reached people groups in Thailand. Nick and Tracy Darrington, uh, they've been members of our church for a while, but they have sold their homes. They have quit their jobs. They have accepted new jobs. And the only thing standing in their way Buying plane tickets this month is about $900 
in monthly support. If you do the math, that's about 25 families supporting them at less than $40 a month. Folks, I am confident we could knock that out before I even finish this sermon. In fact, you can push pause right now. Shoot me an email, missions at graceky.org. I'll put you in touch with them. Let's knock this out today. Their kids need to get enrolled in school for the fall anyway. Friends, if you want to get excited about what God's doing in the world, this is how it's done. Jump in, get your hands dirty in the work of sending. If you have questions or or you want to get involved or you want to see how can you participate in being a sender into those least reached people groups or, or biblical counseling training, I would love to chat. Shoot me an email, graceky.org, missions at graceky.org. I want to let you in on a little secret. Some of you know, I think most of you will be surprised though, those folks aren't the only ones that God has sent out from Grace Fellowship Church. The reality is, every Christian is sent by God. That doesn't mean that every Christian is a missionary. We'll we'll get into that a little later. But it does mean that if you are a Christian, you are sent. Just as certainly as those folks living in other countries are sent. All Christians are sent. I can understand if you feel a little skeptical about that statement, right? Maybe you're saying to yourself, I don't feel sent. I've lived here a long time. I don't even have a passport. I'm more of a behind-the-scenes Christian, really. I mean, I love Jesus, but to be honest, I don't even like praying out loud that much. I'm a sender, not a goer. I'm one of those people that do the sending, not the being sent. Uh, Folks, this is your captain speaking. Please observe the fastened seatbelt sign has been turned on. We're expecting a little bit of turbulence up ahead. I want to spend the rest of our time together exploring what God says in His Word about His plan for saving the world and our role in it. If you you took a survey of all the activities, all the actions that God does that are recorded in the Bible, I think you'd be surprised to see that one of His favorite things to do is send. Send. It kind of struck me as odd that, that an, you know, an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God, like those, are, those are the qualities that separate him from us. He's God, we are not. Right? Why, would, why would an all-powerful, omnipresent God do so much sending? Truthfully, I have no idea. <laughs> Honestly, I have no idea. Maybe it's like asking, why does God make pretty things and put them in places no one will ever see them? right, flowers and fish, planets, maybe he just likes them. Maybe he just likes sending. I don't know, but you cannot deny that God sends a lot. He sends all kinds of things to all kinds of places for all kinds of reasons. And I think that's the the number one point we need to get today. We serve a sending God. He sends angels and demons. He sends armies, insects. He sends wind, fire, rain, earth, I guess. Um, But just think, just think of a story, one story that you're familiar with in the Bible. I bet in that story there is someone or something being sent somewhere for some purpose by God. Take Joseph in Egypt, for instance. Joseph was sent to Egypt, right, by his brother, sold to Egypt by his brothers. Uh, But by the end of the story, we see that even that human sending, it's really God. He tells his brothers in in Genesis chapter 45, we're familiar with the you meant it for evil, but, but God intended it for good. But even their sending was dictated by God. Right, in Genesis chapter 45, he says, God sent me. He says it three times, God sent me. So it was not you, but God sent me to preserve a people alive. Sometimes he'll even double down on the sending. He'll send an angel to a prophet, but then that prophet goes to a a city or a king. And we see it over and over and over again. 
up until we get to John the baptizer, right? He's a, a man sent by God to prepare the way for the God-man, Jesus, who is also sent from God. Maybe you're familiar with John 3.16. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but in order the world might be saved through him. Friends, I don't know if I can show it any more clearly. We serve a sending God. And if God is willing to send his own son, Jesus, I think we can safely assume he is willing to send us too. Fortunately, we don't need to rely on assumptions. Turn with me to John chapter 17. The book of John chapter 17, this is Jesus praying to the Father in the presence of his disciples just hours before he's murdered and betrayed. John chapter 17, pick it up in verse 13. Jesus is saying, But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak to the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. You sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, so they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Folks, in this prayer, Jesus leaves no room for doubt. If you're in Jesus, he is sending you, just as surely as he himself was sent to us. I hope you're at least convinced of your role as a sent one. Because regardless of your qualifications or your availability, right, no matter your giftings or whatever garbage you bring with you, he knows your resources. He knows your rap sheet. And he is still sending you. And so the question we should be asking isn't, am I sent? That's a relevant question, and people ask it all the time. But the answer is obvious. Yes, you're sent. The only relevant questions left are to whom and with what? Who will he send you to? And what will he send you with? I believe our brother Paul can help us answer those questions. If you turn to 2 Corinthians, book of 2 Corinthians, Chapter 5, Paul writes to the believers in his day regularly about their identity as sent ones. But this is by far my favorite encouragement to those who are sent. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll start in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. Folks, as adopted children of God, we are sent in a way nothing else in creation is sent. Not the birds, not the bugs, not trees, not even angels are sent like we are. We are ambassadors of God. That is what we are sent 
for. The message of hope that the world can be reconciled to God. That is what we've been sent with. And that is who we've been sent to. If you are a Christian, then you are being sent as the physical representative of God with a message of hope for the world. Now, if you're anything like me, that role of ambassador is actually a lot more confusing and produces more anxiety than it does clarity and excitement. My first thought when I heard this, if I'm, if I'm being real, was not, yay, I get to be an ambassador to the world. It was more like, oh, great, one more thing that I get to screw up. I mean, how do I even start being an ambassador to the world, right? I just represent God. No big deal. Sure. Uh, no pressure. I, I can do that, right? Folks, if that's you, I have some good news. God has been working in my life to change my thinking, my paradigm on what it is to be an ambassador, and I think it can help you as well. The first thing that God had to change in my mind about being an ambassador is that the person who sends you gives you a message that is much more important than who he sent you to. Right? For any ambassador, for every ambassador... What you're sent with is greatly more important, vastly more important than who you are sent to. And we see this clearly if you've ever been on the receiving end of a package, right? whether it's Amazon or Pizza Hut. We don't care if they get the address right. If they show up with the wrong package, friends, that's a fail. If you want clarity on who God is sending you to, Start by clarifying the message he sent you with. Folks, learn the gospel. Become fluent in the gospel. Become experts in the process of salvation. If God really is reconciling the whole world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, how does it happen? What are the guiding principles? What are the practical steps? Don't just know the message. Be fluent in it. Learn it backwards and forwards, inside and out. Break it apart. Rebuild it. Do it again. Do it again blindfolded. Folks, run that message through your mind until you can repeat it flawlessly when you're tired, when you're hurting, when you're hungry. He has entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation. Have you thought about what that means? Can you explain that to someone? Could you explain it to a five-year-old? Just because we've heard the good news about Jesus, please don't assume that you know it by heart. Prove it. Practice it. Folks, if you don't know where to start becoming fluent in this ministry of reconciliation, the message of the gospel, if you're not sure where to start, text your community group leader. If you're not in a community group, shoot me an email. I'll at least get you pointed in the right direction. But this cannot wait until tomorrow. This is our job. Friends, I can guarantee you, the better you become, at saying the message we've been given, the more opportunity you'll have to deliver it. This is the kind of message where if you know it well, you will never have to wonder who it goes to. The second most helpful change in my thinking that that God's had to work in my life is, is that for an ambassador, no matter who you work for, The flag that you fly and you represent is vastly more important than whatever badge you wear. We've all seen it in in these movies, right, where this diplomatic vehicle rose up or or there's a podium with a flag behind them, right? Every, Every single time we see the UN assembly, there's the little tiny flag next to their microphone. Folks, that flag is not the only thing 
that each of those ambassadors has. Every individual is going to also have a personal name badge. Right? It'll have their photo on it, maybe, maybe some other relevant identification, security clearance, maybe a, a title that they've been given or, or a degree that they've earned. All of those details matter. Right? Those are relevant to that person and their background. It, it shows their expertise. It shows why they should be an ambassador. But friends, for every ambassador, those details fade into the background compared against who sent them and what they represent. Scroll up in, in 2 Corinthians. Scroll up to verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. That means that when God reconciled us to himself in Christ Jesus, he not only made us ambassadors of reconciliation, he completely overshadowed everything we could have brought to the table that isn't Christ. He completely overshadowed our our skills, our abilities, our preferences, our, our allegiances, whatever we've earned or accomplished, all of our rights and privileges, our heritage, our ethnicity, not saying that these things don't exist anymore. They just don't matter as much anymore. Uh, this is your captain speaking again. Please remain seated until the fastened seatbelt sign has turned off. Thank you. You might be thinking that's a little overboard. Right, that we would have to give up everything that we have used to identify our lives before. But truthfully, I kind of toned it down a little bit for you. If you turn over to the book of Philippians, leave a, leave a marker in 2 Corinthians. Turn over to the book of Philippians. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's our brother Paul again. Philippians chapter 3. Paul looks at a list of personal qualifications, and he says, those things that I thought were advantages are actually liabilities. Philippians chapter 3, pick it up in verse 3. For we, the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he, he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as a loss. For the sake of Christ... Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Friends, that list that Paul is saying is rubbish, that's not luxury items that you add on to a solid life. Why, those are the very things that make up a solid life. Those are the things that defined Paul's life. The same way that our preferences, our loyalties, our abilities, our accomplishments define our lives today. And as much as I love having my cake and eating it too, it just isn't an option for ambassadors. Not even King Jesus himself was exempt. Turn the page back to chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2. All right, let's pick it up in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, 
which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Friends, I'm not going to pretend to understand the mechanics of God becoming a man. But what I do see is that when Jesus became the ambassador of reconciliation, even the God-man had to let parts of his perfect identity fade into the background as he embraced humility. How much more will we have to lay aside the things that used to identify us? I hope you kept a a finger in 2 Corinthians. We're going to We're going to wrap things up back there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There's one more way that I think the flag we represent is more important than any of the badges that we could wear. I know for myself and and I suspect for, for quite a few of you, not all of the badges that I wear are things I'm proud of. They're not all things I would want to hold on to. A lot of them, actually, I would prefer to keep hidden, maybe in a pocket, right? Maybe under my jacket. These are the marks of shame and dishonor that I've earned from a life of rebellion against God. One of the names the Bible uses for our enemy is he is the accuser of the saints. And he is both quick and thorough in bringing up exactly how we are disqualified from being ambassadors. Maybe you have a similar reel that goes through your mind. Stop me when this gets familiar. Would God really use someone like you? Really? You? A liar? A cheater? A coward? A glutton? A doubter? Really? Somebody like you is going to be an ambassador? You know, you really haven't changed at all. What makes you think you could represent God to the world? I mean, sure, He forgave you, but you really think He's forgotten about your addiction, your adultery, your hatred, your greed, your... You fill in the blank. The list goes on and on and on. Friends, Please hear me. If you you get nothing else out of this, please hear this. There is no sin that you have done or has been done to you that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I'll say that again slowly. There is no sin that you have done or has been done to you that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That is the power of the gospel. That that is the entire message and the point of reconciliation. God is reconciling the world to Himself through Christ. And perhaps those are based in fact. For most people... If you are a Christian, those accusations are factual. But they are not the truth about you. Never let the facts get in the way of the truth. The truth is in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old is passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God. This is why whatever badge you wear could never compare with the flag that you represent now. Folks, God never sends the old. He only ever sends a new creation as an ambassador. And if you are a new creation, He will send you. No exceptions. 
I'll say it as plainly as I can. Every Christian is sent by God as an ambassador to the world with an urgent message for the world. Be reconciled to God. It sounds simple. It is simple. But it's not easy. Being an ambassador is more than just slapping a a bumper sticker on your van or or, or putting a a verse as your email uh, signature. Being an ambassador is a lifestyle. It's a career, not a hobby. But it's also a great honor, not just a heavy obligation. So as we close, I want to give you three next steps and then two words of caution. We'll do the next steps first, right? So maybe you're thinking, okay, okay, fine. I'm an ambassador to the world. Uh, now what? Right? I, I don't know how to do that. I don't have any skills. I don't have any time. I don't have any money. What, what am I supposed to do? How do I start? Okay. Slow down. Take a breath. We take it one step at a time, just like everything else. Step one, pray. Talk to God about you being an ambassador to the world. This whole thing was his idea anyway. So who better to talk it over with? Pray. Take some time and talk with him about what it means for you to be an ambassador in the world. Step two, I already mentioned this, but but start working your way towards fluency in the gospel. Build your vocabulary. Know what you believe about salvation, yes, but also be able to talk about it, right? Learn how to say what you know. Practice with one another. How do the pieces fit together? If you can, grab some fellow Christians and start practicing together. If no one will join you, then resolve now to be the odd one out in your circle for just a little while. And again, shoot me an email. We'll talk about it. We'll point you in the right direction. Last step, number three, pray. Yeah, I'm going to use prayer twice. You all could use the practice. But really, pray for others. Take a personal responsibility for other people's spiritual well-being. Not by fixing their problems, not by giving advice, but by taking their problems to God in prayer. Expecting Him to use that situation for His glory and their good. You don't even need to tell them that, that you're praying for them. But be ready with the gospel for when He decides to move. Taking responsibility for other people's problems doesn't mean you have to get into their lives with your money and your time and your resources, but it usually ends there. Pray first. I think those three are going to be a good start to becoming a faithful ambassador of God to the world. So lastly, there's a couple of cautions. Number one, please Don't try to be an ambassador of reconciliation if you yourself have not been reconciled to God. If you know that there is sin that has not been dealt with, don't try to muscle through. This is not a fake it till you make it time. Confess. Repent. Be healed. And if you've never submitted your life to the authority of of King Jesus, if you've never begged for his forgiveness and mercy, if you haven't experienced God's kindness and his love, friend, today is your lucky day. You didn't listen to all of this by accident. Be reconciled to God. He will not turn you down. My second caution is a little more complicated. I said in the beginning that that every Christian is sent, but not every Christian is a missionary. What that means is while all of us are sent as ambassadors to the world, most of us are going to be sent to our own communities, our own culture, maybe even our own family. But there are folks in every culture Christians that have been reconciled to God from every language, people group, and tribe. 
And they have been called and sent to be ambassadors to another culture. They've been given grace. They've been given the grace necessary to, to uproot their lives, to sacrifice their time, their success, their culture. For the sake of taking the gospel across barriers of language, of geography, perhaps even of prejudice. And we call that kind of sending missionary. Not because that person is special, right? An ambassador just goes wherever they're sent. But because the challenges that they face are unique. Think of it this way. Every parenting situation uh, is exactly the same in that it will necessarily involve children, right? Being a parent means children. But there are some situations, right, some parenting situations that have special challenges, and so they get different names. There are even several names for parenting a child that's not related to you by blood, right? We have uh, foster parenting, we have uh, adoptive parenting, we have step-parents, And so, yes, all parents have children, but not all parents face the same challenges. And so, yes, all Christians are sent, but not all sent ones face the same challenges. So, you see, in some ways, this message is a little bit of a gamble for me. Because if I tell people that they can be ambassadors to the world on behalf of God, saying, be reconciled to God, but they can do it without the maximum amount of sacrifice or the highest degree of challenge, then why would anybody choose to be a missionary? It's a bit of a gamble because if you look at the statistics today, fewer and fewer people are making that decision. In fact, people are leaving the mission field much faster than they're being sent. Now, The population of missionaries is aging, and so retirement and health issues become an issue, but the average stay of a missionary is also decreasing. And that means the the net result is fewer and fewer ambassadors are being sent to the hardest and darkest places. So yes, the, the Word of God and the Kingdom of God are advancing, but it's not an even front. There are a lot of surveys, lots of very smart people are doing research into why this is, but I have my own theory about why people are choosing not to be missionaries. And this is just a hunch, but man, do I hope I'm right, because otherwise I'm out of a job pretty soon. I think people choose not to be missionaries, not because they look at the cost Right? People sacrifice for things all the time. And frankly, the cost used to be a lot steeper. Right? Missionaries used to pack all of their stuff in coffins. Talk about a one-way ticket. No, I, I, I don't think it's the price tag that's changed people's minds about mission work. I think most people are simply unaware of what they're missing out on. Hebrews chapter 12 says that our King Jesus endured His death on the cross because there was joy waiting for Him on the other side of the sacrifice. Friends, there are some joys, some pleasures in this life that cannot be told. They must be experienced. And I think the life of a sent one It's like that. I dare you to try and simply explain the taste of fresh pineapple or honey. I dare you to try to describe the the rush of a roller coaster or skiing on fresh snow. Where would you even start to describe the, the complex web of emotions and experiences that makes up a flawless game, or your favorite chair, or your best friend. No. No, there are some sweet and peculiar flavors, an unmistakable rush, a complex and unexplainable joy 
that belongs only to the people willing to live as sent ones. Jesus knew it. Paul knew it. Our missionaries know it. Do you? If you do, then you also know a couple of other things. You know that the joy you feel is worth the price you paid to get it. And you also know you're going to go wherever you have to to get more of it. That's how God is going to send more missionaries. I'm certain of it. I'm going to leave you with a short quote from a French author. He wrote the the children's book, The Little Prince. He says, If you wish to build a ship, do not divide the men into teams and send them out into the forest to cut wood. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. God's joy His personal happiness is more vast and endless than any sea. And he gives every Christian, every sent one, the opportunity to hear those glorious words from the parable in Matthew 25. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come. Share in your master's happiness. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. You reconciled us to yourself at great cost, and we can never say thank you enough. Ask God that you would give us grace and faith to live as ambassadors of your ministry of reconciliation. Make us skilled, Father. Make us bold and courageous to give this hope to the world around us. And would you send us now, even today, into the world because of your reputation. Amen. You are here. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. As you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here. 
turning lives around I worship you I worship you You are here Mending every heart I worship you stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop Seeing you working, even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle work, a promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You're the way maker. We make a miracle work, a promise. remember that this week, that that is who our great Savior is, our way maker. But he's not just the maker. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And we can now come to the Father through Jesus, our great Savior. Amen. Have a great week.